this episode of Happy Place came about because you you sent me an email and it was really nice to hear from you. I haven't seen you in quite a while. And I sat there reading your email, um, just kind of, you know, really grateful that you were willing to share your story with me and also kind of in shock because I've known you for so long, but there was so much I didn't know about you. And it's so interesting how that is often the case that we will work with people every day or we will see, you know, parents at the school gate and we just don't know the half of it. And it, and it, that is certainly the case with you. So, you know, you had this moment last year, October last year, where you decided to talk very publicly about a part of your life that you hadn't before, but via the medium of song. And you released this song called Your Car, which is about your, your late dad. And oh my God, I mean, the first time I heard that song, it broke me in too. It is just, it's as raw as you get. It's so, well, as you know, you wrote it, it's utterly beautiful. And this explores, you know, the, the relationship you have with your dad and, and the difficulties of your childhood. Why did the medium of song feel right? Because that's obviously a very new thing for you. Yeah. So firstly, thanks for saying nice things about it. And thanks for listening to it. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very strange hearing people um, talk about it, or even knowing that people have listened to it or connected to it in some way, because it was an incredibly uh, uh, worrying thing to, to put out there. And I sort of sat on it for a, li for a little while. Um, so, so about the age when I probably came and did radio with you it was I was sort of in the epicenter of of what, what had been going on which is that my dad um took his own life when I was god I must have been 22 I think it's quite hard um I, the sort of my autobiographical memory for that time is really cloudy as I, I guess as a sort of self-protection thing over yeah. the years um so when I was 22, he, yeah, he, he killed himself and it, it wasn't totally unexpected. He, um, he had suffered with, we think bipolar, but basically a manic depression. So he would have these massive waves of quite intense manic energy where he'd stay up all night and he'd go off and do wild things. Um, and then the flip side of that is that he was deeply, deeply depressed and, um, you know, I've experienced, and we'll talk about it later, I've experienced depression to a degree, but what he was suffering was, in, I sort of never seen anything like it, it was incredibly debilitating, he, he, he sort of couldn't get out of bed or do anything, and he was incredibly anxious, and, um, and he was sort of going through that, and then he and I, when I, when I was a teenager, he and I had had this tremendous uh, fallout, and we we hadn't really well he hadn't really reached out to kind of try and repair the bonds and uh and eventually i had to do it when i was sort of 18 and um it was it was quite difficult because i didn't really like him as a person i, I had a lot of hatred towards him but i also loved him because he was my dad and um i went to see him and I, I, I could tell at that time that he wasn't really himself and I didn't know what it was that was going on. And then he he made a, he wrote a suicide note about maybe four months before he then eventually did kill himself. And uh, my mum found it and he he basically intimated that he was going to go off and, and uh, I think he said he was going to walk into the sea or something like that. Anyway, massive, like, police manhunt they, they were incredibly quick at reacting and they went and they they found him and at that point I was living in London I was like right this is bad something's going on here I'm gonna have to go home and have a chat and I went back and he was just incredibly depressed and um he he felt very helpless and he revealed to me something which now I know it I almost feel foolish for not putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together when I was a kid, because there were so many signs there. He revealed that he was an alcoholic. And as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, I, do you know what? I kind of must have known that on some level. My own relationship with alcohol has been that I've never wanted to go near it. I've never, never touched it. My sister was the same. 
So there was something, there was obviously something about it that had connected with me. And since working with the therapist to kind of explore this stuff, which I had really tried to bury very deep because it was extremely painful. Um, I sort of was able to connect loads of dots from my childhood and anyone who's got an alcoholic family member or an alcoholic parent or maybe is an alcoholic themselves will kind of know that there are so many clues and signs there but it's often hidden or it's just denied if it's ever raised it's sort of um it's either denied or or an energy comes out which means that it's off limits for for talking about and that was very much the the sort of the energy of the household you know it was if anything was ever mentioned about um drinking it was just oh no no no, swept under the rug or you know my dad would get angry about it and so when he said to me I you know I think I'm an alcoholic immediately we kind of well firstly for me it was a, a revelation of how did I not know this and how could I have not helped sooner and the first thing we did was try and get him into an AA meeting which he went to and he went to that uh, I guess you know maybe on and off over those next couple of months and on the day that he died, he was meant to go to, to one of those meetings, but didn't. And, you know, I think he had been continuing to drink and continuing to suffer with deep, deeply with the depression and, uh, and yeah, took his own life. And he did it in our, in our family home. My mum was the person that discovered him. And um, my, my initial feeling about it was one of just absolute anger towards him that he could do that to himself and to us and to my mum that she would have to experience that and you know I've not spoken to her much about it because I I know that if I sort of knew the room where it had happened it would taint my memories of that house and of my childhood irreparably I think and so I've sort of shielded myself from the details um so I had, so it happened, this thing happened, and I sort of felt like I was sucked from my life in London, which I'd sort of run away to anyway, because I'd had such a bad relationship with him. You know, I left house as kind of early as I could really, and got got out and was really lucky that I landed CBBC and was able to kind of embark upon a, a life away from my childhood. Um, but it sort of sucked me back to, to Portsmouth which is where I'm from for for a few days and you know we had to arrange the funeral and anyone who's been through this it's just it's chaotic and my mum was in no state to do anything and I I guess I took on the energy of like the organizer which is very opposite to my general life I'm very disorganized but I was like right I'm gonna ignore the hatred and the sadness and I'm just gonna we're gonna organize a funeral and I'm gonna go back to my life and that's what I did. And I, I came back to my life and I just did not talk about it with anyone for years and years. My closest friends wouldn't, you know, they came to the funeral, they knew what happened, but we just never spoke about it. It was utter, uh, almost like a denial that it had happened because I was so angry, I was so angry and so upset. And, uh, and it was easier, the story was easier in my head for it to be, oh, I didn't like him anyway, he's dead now. Um, uh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm fine. And of course I wasn't fine. I just wasn't, I did, I had no root part to access that. And then I guess around my sort of mid to late twenties, I, I started getting depressive episodes and I, I thought, oh, I, maybe I've got something like my dad had you know some sort of depression and they would sort of come in these quite cyclical waves where I would feel pretty good and then I really wouldn't feel good and the I, I couldn't I couldn't really put a finger on how long the not feeling good would last for and when I wasn't feeling good I was you know really panicked because anyone who's experienced depression you sort of feel like as much as you can reason oh this maybe won't happen forever uh it, at the time you that logic doesn't really hit through it's just you just feel really low really low and so I eventually I mean I tried a few things I tried to do um some cognitive behavioral therapy through the NHS and 
the problem was that by the time I came to do it, such a long waiting list, by the time I came to do it, I was no longer in a depressive state. And I thought, ah, this was like a problem from, 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 from another guy. And so I just sort of didn't take it seriously. And it wasn't until maybe I'd had three or four of these, I thought I really need to go and see someone about this. I went to a doctor and said, hi, I, I have this thing where, um, where I get depressed quite a lot. And they said, well, there, are there any other symptoms? And we sort of spoke through my personality and they said, oh yeah, we think you've got this thing called cyclothymia. And then I went to see a, um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I can never remember which one it was, but the person that categorizes these things. And they said, yes, you have this thing called cyclothymia. And I, I'd never heard of it before. I'd never heard anyone talk about it. I didn't know what it was. I had to go and Google it. But it, it, it basically was the answer to who I am. And I always thought I was someone with a lot of energy and excitement and productivity. But it turns out that that's sort of the flip side of that depression I was talking about. And I came to realize, and actually it happened around the birth of my kid, Ivy. I was in one of these slightly more manic phases or up phases. Manic maybe isn't the right word, but it's, it's like a, it's an ultra productive. You feel almost invincible. It's if you've ever been in a, in what people describe as a flow state where the universe kind of disappears and you're singularly focused on a task. I was sort of in a perpetual one of those, which is amazing if you're trying to get ideas out and be productive, but it's quite destructive for the people that you live with because you know, you don't, you forget to eat. You're not interested in life. You don't want to go for a walk. You just want to zone in on whatever this idea you've got, which feels like the most important thing in the world. Just want to zone in on that thing.